Thank you for the introduction and this award. It really is an honor. AAPT has been an integral part of my professional life for so long. You have all inspired me, challenged me, encouraged me, and given me practical advice to enhance my teaching, mentoring, and service here at Eckerd. And just to situate you, this is where I am. Eckerd College. It sits on land that's dredged from the nearby bay, which all of it now falls within the boundaries of the city of St. Petersburg, Florida, which is situated on the land of the Seminole and Tokabaga people. We are a small, private, liberal arts institution that recruits more students to study marine biology than anything else. We do have a physics major, but it is small, which gives us the opportunity to get to know our students and catch a plane ride with them when they get their pilot's license to get this type of photo to show you where the physics building is. In thinking about these two populations of students, the small cohort of majors as well as the large group of non-majors, I find it useful to think about what it is that we do that's unique. What's our mission and why have we chosen to accept it? So, to start us off, I want you to think of a word that describes your feelings about physics or teaching physics. Okay, I hope you have it. Now, think of a word that describes your students' feelings about physics. Part of our mission as teachers is, of course, to bridge this gap. And the ways in which we do this get at, I think, what Hutchins means when he talks about what we alone do. And of course, I'm gonna give you my list. I encourage you to make your own. The first thing on my list is the aha moment. So we're gonna look at a quick demo here. You can see this uh, demo of these light bulbs. They're all on. So it looks like they might all be um, in series or in parallel. And I ask my students to figure out what the wiring is. And so by unscrewing these, so as I unscrew this light bulb, notice that one light bulb gets brighter and the other two get dimmer, but they don't all go out. So they're not in series for sure, but they're also not all just in parallel. We can see that bulbs two and four are connected to each other and one and three are connected to each other in the same way, right? One gets brighter when I remove three. If I remove both one and three, everything goes out. So we can see, in fact, that one and three together are in series with two and four. And so you can figure out with a little bit of work playing around with this, just what this is. And it shouldn't be a surprise to you that it's a network like the one I've drawn here for you. Okay, so in physics, we get to do these demos and they aren't all about theatrics, but that doesn't necessarily hurt. My father, Bill Junkin, who was my first and most influential, and influential physics teacher and mentor, and also a co-author with me. Um, anyway, early on in my teaching career, dad said that he tried to do one demo every day in intro physics. And I thought, well, if a theorist like my dad gives this kind of advice, what type of experimentalist would I be if I said there wasn't time for demos, or what we might call practical effects? Or what we might call practical effects in the movies. We have an actual baby, baby Yoda puppet who's happy to receive the light bulb from the demo. See, there we go. Um, it's a puppet instead of a CGI. So if you need ideas for demos, Pyra is the way to go, and here are some people that I need to thank for their inspiration and help. The beauty of a demo is that you get to see the aha as it happens, when a student has success in figuring it out, especially if they don't think they can figure out the results or it surprised them in some way. So physics is about the aha moments. But physics is also about the universe and everything in it. That makes it easy for me to be part of a liberal arts institution. And this circles us back to Hutchins, who was the president of the University of Chicago, was a passionate defender of the liberal arts, 
from supporting a great books curriculum to arguing against sports teams at a university. He lost that argument, clearly. The physics lineage to this quote from Hutchins is that Carl Sagan uh, studied under him. And Carl Sagan wrote that he felt fortunate to have studied and learned about where science was presented as an integral part of the gorgeous tapestry of human knowledge. We do well, I think, to make sure we connect to that tapestry of human knowledge. For me, this means that when I talk, that I talk about liberal arts whenever I get a chance. And you may have noticed that I'm using fairly broad categories here. Physics includes astronomy and liberal arts includes the sciences, as illustrated here um, by an illustration by the abbess of the Co Covenant of Hamburg. At Eckerd, I've been invited to give the opening lecture of our general education program to the entire first year class. And of course, I include a couple of demos. If you find yourself in that situation, I recommend a Doppler effect demo. You know the one where you swing an annoying buzzer around? It's really good for startling an auditorium of drowsy 18 year olds. In that context, though, while I'm serving as an advocate for science, I also want to problematize things as well by being clear that science is not neutral. For example, it has been recruited in ways that often serve a dominant and damaging narrative. In Stamped from the Beginning, Ibram X. Kendi makes the case that Newton's optics, which we know well, was adapted and adopted to support early racist ideas of color. Kendi makes the case that the scientific understanding of black as the absence of light really helped underpin racist metaphors as um, the US was trying to figure out ways to defend its racist slave trade. We can't ever think that physics operates in a vacuum, somehow disconnected from humanity. So thinking back to what we uni uniquely do, I would argue that it is at our best when we think broadly about the universe, and yes, we define our disciplinary boundaries, but we also converse across these disciplines to connect to Sagan's gorgeous tapestry of human knowledge. But we need to do it while being mindful of the ways it can be used for harm and for good. Next on my list is critical thinking. Now, most educators in any field would say that they engender critical thinking. Where we are unique, I posit, is in the way that we develop it. Let me dispense, dispense with the standard, students need to study different fields to learn about these different ways of knowing. I agree with that statement. It is, in fact, a very good argument for the liberal arts. What I contend is unique about us is that we do a good job of employing a number of linked approaches. Let me see if I can make that case. Think for a moment about a physics class you have taught or are about to teach, and just estimate for me how much time you or your students spend on each of these three elements. Theory, experiment, and computation. Okay, I hope you have it. All of our answers are going to be a little bit different for this, but we do interweave. We have this web of theory, experiment, and computation that we connect. And like many of you, I found video analysis as a go-to tool while teaching remotely. I particularly liked it for student projects, whether it was students determining the size of a dolphin here, or the size of the board on which Jack and Rose could have both survived in the Titanic, video analysis is such a powerful tool. Tracker, in particular, can serve as a bridge build to, between building computation, computational models and experiments, not just between theory. As we can see here, an example where we build a model of the Coriolis force. So here I need to make sure and thank both Doug and Aaron, both of whom I, I've borrowed so much from along the way. 
Or let's think about other ways we infuse computation through the curriculum. I've used EJS, Easy Java Simulations, but I've used GlowScript from Pickup and other Python-based platforms. The point here is that we use lots of tools, demos, experiments, video analysis, computational models, to link different parts of our interconnected web to develop deep critical thinking. When I think about what I want it to look like in practice, I really love this image that's evoked by this description by Margot Shetterly in Hidden Figures. They turn their desks into a trigonometric war room, poring over equations, scrawling ideas on, a black, on blackboards, evaluating their work, erasing it, starting over. Okay, so maybe we're not building a trigonometric war room, but a problem-solving room nonetheless. It is, I think, about our engagement. How do we get our students to engage with each other in this way? And at this point in the talk, as I was putting this talk together, I realized this is what I miss the most from Zoom teaching. The buzz, and dare I say, the electricity of the clear engagement. This happened in some of my Zoom breakout rooms, but definitely not as consistently as in in-person teaching. So how do we engender this type of energy in the class? I owe a debt to so many of you as we have, over time, wrestled with this idea together here at AAPT meetings. The workshops for PTRA and that I did as a leader for Tom and Duane I was officially there to help, but I probably learned as much, if not more, than anyone else. And of course, thinking about the types of problems, explorations, and illustrations to include in Fizzlet Physics and then in Fizzlet Quantum Physics have profoundly shaped how I think about this war room that Shetterly described. Using simulations to encounter richer problems was from the outset a revolutionary and exciting idea to me. And now, some 20 years later, it continues to challenge my students. Sometimes, for an illustration, all you need is a simple visualization, like this one, where I have a wave and particles colliding together. I've used this with students of all ages, to point out that when we glibly say wave-particle duality, this is a weird thing, right? Waves and particles are very different, and it just takes a simple simulation to show that they are really different when they collide with each other, for example. Or, in intro physics with fizzlets, I have, you have a problem here where you're supposed to find this unknown charge, and I'm going to start moving around. And you can solve this problem anywhere this unknown charge is, because you can measure the electric field at this dot, for example. But it's easiest. The interaction really makes a difference, because if you can line it up so that your electric field right at that center dot is pretty close to zero, right in there, it's very close to zero, then that makes it a much easier problem in terms of solving for the unknown charge. I'm grateful to have had this opportunity to think about and develop the materials to push our students that I had as part of the Open Source Physics Project, and working in particular with Wolfgang Christian and Maria Bologna, as well as the rest of the Open Source Physics team. It seems to me physics is, if not unique, a leader for us in terms of critical thinking because it involves leveraging the many different ways we can encourage student engagement. It's this connecting the parts of the, the interconnected web that we use, but we never lose sight of the connection to the observable world. Now this is, brings me to my next question as a method to try to keep you engaged in this talk. I want you to think about something tangible you have made, built, or created. 
you can see mine. My guess is that just thinking about what that gave you a sense of accomplishment, a boost of self-confidence. I made that. And it was immersive. Often, but not always, you are wholly engaged. I think that the integration of the maker movement into education means that we have yet another tool to get students to actually do things away from computer screens. At Eckerd, this includes things like blacksmithing, as well as the more typical 3D printing and laser cutting. We've had some success with first-year students at Eckerd. Um, for students who are interested in physics and the mathematical sciences, where they learn some CAD, some microelectronics, and then teach this to local middle school students, as well as building their own projects. Because we are small in terms of our physics majors, we need to connect our potential majors to other students with similar interests. And this project-based course that lasts over uh, the academic year does a nice job of helping build a cohort. Especially when the biggest takeaway from a course like this is that very little works right the first time. It's the troubleshooting where you're doing most of the learning, not the success of your project. On a small scale, then I would say, I think that making is one route of inviting students into physics, which brings me then past my mission statement to a challenge that we have. And sadly, this is a place where physics is almost unique as well. We have a serious culture problem. It isn't just that we're seen as geeky, although this probably contributes. It's also that we recruit stereotypes. No matter how neutral the initial presentation of information, people do tend to gradually recruit the stereotypes and associations that are prevalent in a culture and then project that. I was fortunate to be a part of an effort to support women in STEM at small liberal arts colleges through the NSF Advanced Program that began back in 20, 2007. This project built mutual mentoring networks of senior women science faculty in the liberal arts. And even though I had been mentoring students and junior faculty for quite some time, I didn't realize how much difference a mentor would make for me in my personal and professional life. Talking with my peer mentoring group every other week has been one of the most meaningful professional experiences. Our best description of what happens is that we find it, in fact, to be a resonant experience. Whether we Skyped and now Zoom about a student issue, family issue, or college policy, there's always good advice. And you really don't have to explain the context. Everybody else gets it right away. It was so important to us that working through AAPT with the leadership team that you see here, we got an NSF advance grant to fund similar networks for physics, the E-Alliance Project. And we have been so pleased to see the positive impact it has had on other women in physics. A peer mentoring group shouldn't, however, be limited to women or women in higher ed, which is one of the constraints around this particular funding source. Anyone can benefit, but we think it is particularly important for physicists who are isolated in whatever, and whatever ways you experience that isolation. Combating isolation is a small step, I would argue, to making physics a more diverse and inclusive community. But small steps matter, as Jess Wade reminds us. Even though you feel like you're very small, you can have a huge impact on the way that people perceive science, scientists, and also the way that young people access education. I'm a white, cisgender, tenure, full professor. This puts me in a position of great privilege. Those of us in positions of privilege have a greater share of responsibility for this work. We need to channel our inner ray and do Jedi B work. Justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging work. Just to remind you, diversity is about representation. 
Who is a part of the community? And is there a critical mass? Yep, you heard the language of physics there as well. Equity is about equal access and support. You can see this in a familiar cartoon about the difference between equality and equity and then justice about looking at the underlying social structure. And inclusion and belonging. While they're related to each other, they aren't the same. You can be included. Think about the childhood experience of picking teams. Everyone is included, but the person who was picked last, they know they don't belong. I find it useful here to be reminded again of why Jedi B work is so important. I see it as a justice issue. Access to a dark night sky to see and be inspired by the universe as it really is should be a human right, not a luxury for the chosen few. And if you haven't read The Disordered Cosmos or know about it, I strongly recommend it. It's about justice, not about growing the physics workforce, but about access and sharing something we love and making it available to all. So what can you do, whether you're starting or continuing? If you're someone at a college or a university, consider sea change. Team up. At a high school, consider step up. At your school, show up at an event sponsored by your Black Student Union, Multicultural Office, Black Lives Matter. You pick your organization. In your teaching, learn about and use a belongingness intervention in your class. Take lesson plans from the underrepresented curriculum project. Do some reading. At this meeting, go to the DEI room. Participate in the discussion of a picture a scientist on Tuesday afternoon. Okay, so this brings me to some homework. What kind of teacher would I be if I didn't assign homework? What specific step are you going to take in the next month that will be Jedi B work? Okay, a final comment. This will, of course, take perseverance. And as perseverance reminds us, via some work with binary, the white panels are zero and the reds are one, starting from the center, we should then dare mighty things. Which I think is fun. It's a fun puzzle. Yes, it's geeky, but I like this kind of puzzle. And so I've chosen to have a reminder of it in the Perseverance Parachute. What can I say? I like wearing geeky skirts. For me, it is a fun way to celebrate being a physics teacher. I hope you will celebrate your uniqueness as a physics teacher in whatever way fits you. So thank you. To my colleagues and friends at Eckerd, my students, and especially those in the physics department, and to my family, some of whom are here as part of my AV team. And finally, thank you so much for attending this talk and participating.